And we use this word called activation, which I first heard from Bishop Hammond. And there's one thing about impartation, we know that. There's also just knowledge. You can just sit in a class and take notes. That's all good. But the impartation is when you actually receive the gift from the person that's speaking. And the activation is like a switch being thrown on in you to start using it. And I use that uh, example with Chuck Pierce a lot because we've been with him so many times over the years. And it wasn't just that we were in a meeting and he, he, he brought out great revelations from Scripture. But when we left the meeting, we didn't just know more about the prophetic. We were acting in more of a prophetic way. That's what an impartation and an activation does. So if you don't press into it like this man did when he, when he left here, he stepped out in faith. And prophetic evangelism is one of the most effective ways to get people saved. This morning, if you were here in our church service, you heard the testimony of what happened in Perth Amboy yesterday. I know some of the pastors are here from Perth Amboy, and they're still, you know, just it's amazing how God moved outside the walls of the church. And their church happens to be right next to a Planned uh, Parenthood clinic that does abortion. And while they were worshiping inside, there was a lady outside witnessing, and one of, the, one of the young ladies that went inside to have an abortion got convicted, and they had prayed that, and she came out and said, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Amen? So this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take it outside the four walls of the church. There's a hurting world out there. And we're not just in the bunker hoping that, you know, he'll come back. Hurry up, Jesus, get me out of here. It's a mess down here. No, no, we're supposed to occupy. He said, occupy until I come. The kingdom of God suffers violence. The violence, take it by force. The violent, take it by force. And uh, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And then in John 20, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you to go destroy the works of the devil. I'm, I'm putting up one more slide here. Can you give it to me now, Ray, just for a minute? Um, the, uh, I just want you to know some of our history, but also if you have a desire to learn more, we're connected with Wagner Leadership Institute, which is run by Che An, but was started by Peter Wagner, and it's called, it was called Wagner Leadership Institute, but now it's actually Wagner University. And Peter Wagner was a very highly educated man. He had a PhD, and he was teaching PhD students at Fuller Theological Seminary. I won't give you the whole background on it. But he got convicted because he had taught for years that the Holy Spirit was not for today. And Princeton University is not too far from here. They've been teaching that for 100 years. That's where cessationism was birthed, was at Princeton, believe it or not. Jonathan Edwards, who's one of the founders of the Great Awakening, is buried at Princeton. He was the first president. And it flipped over because one of the ruling things that we deal with here is intellect and, and the idolatry of IQ. I'd rather have HG, Holy Ghost, than IQ anytime, right? So look, it's not that we don't still, obviously we're, we ran a school, so we're, we're open to that. But the letter kills and the spirit gives life, okay? So many times, he, Peter realized that in order to get an MDiv, you know what that is, right? A master's in divinity. You need a four-year degree before you could even apply. And he's like, well, what about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry? Why should people be shut out from getting good biblical education or take a class and not get credit for that? So if you've got community uh, college credits, you can apply it towards Wagner University. It's an accredited university. So that can apply towards your degree. And if you've already got a four-year degree, you can just start right at Wagner University and get uh, the master's degree through them. And that's what we do for our staff people here, the, the people on our team. We support them getting the, the degree through Wagner, depending on where they are, like Dave Torres uh, down front here. How far are you, about a year in? Yeah, about a year in and learning a lot, right? But it's our, it's our DNA. Okay, it's this idea that the church is not just here to be just the local church, but that we're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. We want to be a hub. We don't, we don't say that you can only have the resources of this church if you're a member of this church, right? That's okay if, if other people want to look at it that way, but we feel called to be a regional equipping center, and you're not... We're, there, there's no hook attached here, right? We're, we're looking at this as God's kingdom, and if you're part of a different church, praise God. 
Whatever you take here, take back with you. Whatever you get, deposit it, multiply it. Because if there's going to be a revival, and how many know we need one? It's not going to be one church. Right? That's, that's, that's thinking too, with too much scarcity. This is just in our opinion now, okay? There's other churches that do things differently, but we don't want you to, to think that we thought about this lightly. What's the goal? It's not to grow my church. It's not my church. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, right? So first of all, it's his church. And the goal is not to grow a church. The goal is to expand the kingdom. It's for more people to understand Jesus Christ is the king of the universe, and he's going to be the Lord of my life. And when you look through that lens, it's called the kingdom lens, not just the local church lens, right? Something about the local church can feel like it's us and them. Not supposed to feel that way. He doesn't want one person to perish. So as we all just get activated in compounding revelation, I, wrote, I, put, I put George Alden Ladd up here because he had a very strong influence on Peter Wagner and John Wimber, who you may or may not know, but both of them had a big influence on Cheon because Cheon was a student in the class at Fuller Theological Seminary where John Wimber and Peter Wagner were teaching. Uh, a, a very significant class there that signs and wonders were breaking out in their class. They weren't just talking about it. They were demonstrating the power. And because the school was got a little rattled by that, they both got fired because too many people were getting healed. I know, it's really not funny, is it? But it's true. So I'll just give you a couple of things that I've learned over the years about it. And I'll, I'm going to go a little faster than what I thought. But just, I like to think of, of things in pictures because it helps me realize sometimes that how many of you work outside the church, right? You don't work full time for the church, so you have a job. And when you're at your job, don't you just feel the anointing of God, right? Because all the people around you are Christians. And they all know the word. And they're all just so polite and so kind, aren't they? No, me either. <laughs> So what are you supposed to do? Like just hide? No. You can either let them influence you or you can influence them. One way or another, there's a transaction going on. Either they're going to dominate me or what I'm bringing to the table is going to shift the atmosphere. So you could get to your desk early and pray. And you could say, give me opportunities, Lord. And I promise you, you will flourish if you follow kingdom rules on your job, on your secular job. Even if you might have been asked to do something illegal. I was, several times. No, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do it. And uh, they would never, you know, they're much too smart to ever make it that obvious. And it's usually just right up on the line and right up on the edge, but you have to take a stand. And you know, you could say, well, that's easy for you to say, but I can't afford to lose my job. I know, I get that, I really do, I get that. But you, you should also be able to, to just look people in the eye and say, I'm sorry, that violates my conscience. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I can't do what you just asked me to do. And other people around you are gonna be like, yeah, amen, I'm glad somebody said it. So that's all I'm saying, like, you don't have to leave God in the car in the morning and say, I see you when I get off of work. You bring him in with you. That's what the kingdom's about. It's a very present help in time of trouble. But sometimes it can get kind of blurry, or it could be family, or it could be ministry things that you're doing, or, or just extended family, and it's like, you know, it's just a swirl. And what I've just realized is sometimes I just have to pull back. You, you want to avoid getting emotionally hijacked, okay? That's just never a good thing. You make really bad decisions when the terrorist is in the cockpit. You don't want that. You feel yourself getting heated up. You're being baited to say something. Say, you know what? I need a five-minute break. I'll be right back. And you go in that stall, in that men's room or that lady's room, and you get down and you pray. And you say, Lord, I need your help right now. I'm about to hit somebody. No. See, no, no. One of the fruit of the Spirit is temperance, self-control. When it's starting to get away from you, you pull back. And you know what happens right in the midst of it? This is, this is what happens for me. See, I could pull back, and instead of all those colors being a blur, I could see the face of Jesus in the midst of that situation. If I'm not praying, it looks like this. 
It's crazy. And I pull back a little bit, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you, Lord, because I was about to make a big mistake. And you can think about David when he was really upset when they wouldn't feed his men, and he said, strap on your swords. <laughs> that was so Italian. I'm telling you, strap on your swords. And he was about to go kill Nabal. But Abigail went out and stopped him on the road. That's Holy Spirit. See women? Holy Spirit, smart women, I'm telling you. She stopped him and she said, you're about to make a big mistake. You have a legacy, a heritage, and you're about to shed innocent blood. Why would you do that? Nabal is a fool. That's her husband, by the way. You're going to take everything God blessed you with, and because of one bad decision, you're going to have that ruin you? And he said, you know what? Thank you. I'm glad you stopped me because I was about to kill everybody in your household and you if you didn't come out here. Right? So, look, this is how we have to live. This is part of what the prophetic gift is supposed to do for us is keep us alert and not a victim of our Italian temper or whatever temper you got. No. No, he, can, he comes in and he takes over our nature. So ask him to do that. And then the last thing I'll just say is, this is how the Lord showed me about the fivefold ministry and whether you, I'm not saying it's the only way to look at it, but I just, I like pictures. Like I said, I like to have something I can go back to. And I mentioned this morning that, you know, these ideas of spiritual gift tests and understanding what your temperament and what your gifts are is really important. Because in, in order to flourish, if you were playing on a sports team and you were meant to be the goalie, but they have you playing a different position, you're not going to flourish. And sometimes in the church, we're just not sensitive enough. And we put people, because they're willing, we put them in a role, but they might not be cut out for that role. So we should spend as much time as we can trying to find out what makes somebody tick. And there's a big difference between a greeter and somebody who works up in the booth. Right? The greeter's usually a really outgoing person and real friendly. People in the booth tend to be more into the computers and into all that. We need both, don't we? Yeah, we need both. So the evangelist is going to have a very different personality than the pastor, isn't he? Or she. The pastor's always preparing the next sermon. The evangelist is like, let's get out there and witness. We need them both. The prophet is, is here in God, and, and this is where the worship would be also. And the teacher is like grounded in the next outline and the next revelation that they're getting. They're different, but all are important. And what, what I would say is the, the person in the apostolic role sits in the middle and tries to get this thing rolling so that everybody, all of these gifts are operating in the church, right? That's a gift. That's what Paul would do. He'd go into a new region. He'd get people saved. He'd raise up leaders, start a church, and then he'd move on and do it again. And then come back and visit and come back and give more advice. That's what an apostolic leader would do. And the Bible says that the church is founded on the apostle and the prophet working together. And when it's done right, the reason I put the bow and arrow up there is because a healthy church in community is like that arrow, right? Because this part, the prophet and the teacher are, are giving you the oil of the word and, and, the, and the foundation of the truth, right? It's both. The letter kills, spirit gives life. He's seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And he's given us the shepherd to help us grow and to live in community so that we can be shot out like an arrow to win the lost. And that you could be that prophetic evangelist that I was reading about here. Why not? It's not about how qualified you are, right? It's about how available you are and how willing you are to let him develop those gifts in.